Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. Hello, everybody. This is Sandy. I am a dating and love coach at lastfirstdate.com. Welcome to Last First Date Radio. We are the premier show about attracting and sustaining healthy, lasting, loving relationships after 40. Every week I bring you in-depth interviews with top experts and cutting-edge authors in the field of dating and relationships in midlife. And today I'm going to be speaking with some authors. Um, we actually got a few replacement people here today, but we're going to be speaking with, let me see if I can get everybody's names right. Uh, we have Wilnona, Jade, Dr. Argent, and Renee, and they're going to be speaking about the lessons they learned from dating over several decades. They all bring different levels of expertise and different experiences, and it's going to be fun. I have never done a show with four people at the same time. So this is a first. So if you do want to succeed at dating, which is what my specialty is, and have that amazing relationship that you want, I want you to own your value. And that's really what I stand for. I take a strong, strong stand for helping women become women of value. And what that means is that you don't give up value for anybody. You don't give up your value for a man. You don't give up your value for your coworkers, your friends. But you stand in your value and you have clear boundaries and you speak up for what you want. So if you, um, well, we'll talk about how you can um, find out more in a minute, but every week I bring you a tip on how to be a woman of value. And today's tip is to be more playful. So this is especially true for us women who have been really successful at work and and we've taken on so much responsibility that it's hard to remember to be playful when you're with a partner uh, or a potential partner. And so I want to encourage you to not forget to laugh. I mean, when I talk to a new potential client and I hear her laugh, It's just, it lights her up and it lights me up to hear it. So just imagine what it would be like to be on a date and be able to laugh more and not be so freaking serious because dating is fun when you make it fun. So let's let's be joyful on this journey to find the one. And if you want to become a a woman of value who attracts her best partner, please go to my website, lastfirstdate.com, and sign up for my free guide. This is a new free guide. It's only been up there for a couple months. And it answers the top question that I keep getting asked, which is why do men pull away or disappear? And when you finally figure that out, you can attract and keep the love you deserve. So please stop sabotaging your love life. Start taking back your control and be a true woman of value. And please join my Facebook group. It's a private group, and it's growing daily. It's called Your Last First Date. The conversation is positive, supportive, and juicy. And I want to give a shout-out to our sponsor, Audible. Um, If you would like a free book and a free trial of Audible, which is an amazing service if you are on the go and you want to hear a book because you don't have time to sit and read, which is so true for all of us busy people, just go to audibletrial.com forward slash last first date. That's audibletrial.com forward slash last first date. And if you're watching this on the web and you see the little slideshow, you'll see one of the slides that has the Audible um, URL. So in case you forget it, that's where you can find it. Okay, so let me introduce our amazing guests who are patiently waiting on the other side of this call. So they are called the And I Thought Ladies. They have been interviewed on many shows for their unique approach to love. They have four decades of women's life experiences to show, progress in love comprehension as well as acceptance and new possibilities in love. Their relationship status goes from a burgeoning and 
from an abusive, burgeoning from an abusive relationship to happily married for many years. So let me tell you who we have on this call. We have Will Nona, who is divorced. We have Jade, who found her Prince Charming after many years of dating, and now she's happily married for four years. We have Dr. Argent, who has two doctorates and has dated around the world and run many businesses, and she's also an author. And we have Renee, who's been divorced twice, and she owns her own cleaning service with a fabulous name called Divine Destiny. <laughs> Don't you love it? Welcome, ladies. It's a pleasure to be it's a pleasure here. To be here. <laughs> oh, thank you. So I love your tip, I'm not by sure. the way. I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, people forget to be playful, right? It's such an important <laughs> piece to remember. Um, so we're here to be playful and have fun. So um, I'd like to hear from however many of you want to answer this, but what, what is the most difficult part of a relationship that I, in your experience, and how did you overcome it? Well, I'm going to speak first, I guess. You know, being the youngest in the group, I have so much to say. Okay, so uh, announce your name when, you, when you're when you talking Jade. so we all know who's talking. Jade. This is Jade. This okay, is Jade. hey, Jade. And how old are um, you? I'm 23 and holding. 23, I'm joking, wow. I'm not. I'm not 23. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely not 23. I'm 31. <laughs> okay. Well, 23 is but really I young. Well, I'm 23 and holding. As long as my face can uh, show it up, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, the thing that I found was most important in a relationship and to overcome it was inflexibility. Because when you were trying to date and find the man of your dream, to me, being flexible was very important. And I had to exp- I had to come to grips with the point that can't no no one can be who you you want them to be. You have to accept someone as they are. Mm. So it was inflexibility important. on my part because I was saying, oh, I want all of this on my list, and that's what I want, and. Just because you want it, you have to really go back and reevaluate. This is Wilnona, and I'm going to say the hardest part of any relationship is probably for me the end. <laughs> but mm. coming from an emotionally abusive relationship and being divorced, that I always say that. But the hardest part of starting a new relationship for me is allowing myself to trust someone enough to get close enough to be like, okay. You can come into my walls. You don't have to stand outside and wonder, you know, what she's really thinking or what she's really uh, acting on or why she's pulling away, that sort of thing, just to go ahead and let someone in. It's so hard to do when you've been so guarded and such so many dysfunctional relationships. Okay. So how did, you, how did you overcome your lack of trust or your guardedness? Originally, I'm going to say a very bad thing. Don't anyone follow this advice. I was going to say I had a few shots, but anyway. No, but, <laughs> no. it was actually sitting down and taking time to view people. I remember after the, I got ditched at the altar almost, uh, I remember thinking what went wrong. And I remember saying, well, you know, I have guy friends, but I don't, I don't have many girlfriends. I have a lot of guy friends. So treating them like friends. Because when you want someone to be in your life, you normally get your friends. I mean, your family you're born into, but your friends are the ones that you pick to share it with. So from then on, I chose dating to be like the uh, beginning of a friendship, an emerging friendship. And then after that friendship, I would decide if I wanted to date or not. Hmm. Good good advice. And actually, not having a few shots isn't a bad idea. Um, <laughs> because... You know, that's that's actually why I think Match.com did a study that said that, you know, having a drink makes a date more romantic. And I think that a lot of people are uptight in dating. And it's scary. You're meeting a new person. You know, you, you're you feeling judged often. But if you come in saying, I, I just want to see if I can make a new friend, um, actually the best relationships are friendships caught fire, as they say. So good advice. Okay, so who who's next? Uh, 
This is Renee, and I would probably have to piggyback on what she just said. The hardest thing is really um, in a relationship is building trust again in someone else because you have um, gone through so many different um, uh, deceptions and lies and things of that nature, and to be able to um, let someone in in your in your circle in your heart and and open up again um, with your emotions it is a difficult thing for for those to be able to move on but i think once you can finally get past that point you can then find someone because you're not looking at all of the faults first in a person you're not Mm -hmm. looking for all of these high expectations of them you know that that you have perceived of them or you want them to be. And so it, it, um, it, makes, it, um, it makes it a little easier when you can uh, get to the point where you're okay. You're going to find people that um, may have faults and that makes them who they are. And you grow from that and learn. So um, I, I just wanted to say that, yeah, that's probably one of the hardest things um, probably in the relationship. And the other thing is I think once you get to the point where um, you can then love yourself, uh, that makes it a little easier also because then you're not so worried about what that other person thinks of you and so concerned about, you know, if they're – if you look okay, if you, you, you have on the right makeup or you, you have on the right suit or whatever, you're not so concerned about how they think so much that you're able to be yourself um, around them and just let your mm-hmm. guard down a little bit and be happy. Yeah, so actually your point speaks to both Jade's and Will Nona's points. It's kind of a combo um, to not only start letting your guard down, but also accept people as they are, not as you wish they would be. So you're being more mm-hmm. reali- realistic. And and that self-love piece, I mean, you heard my little intro about being a woman of value. That's that's where it all starts. You know, once you know your standards and you know who you are, it's so much easier to find somebody who loves you because you won't tolerate anything but the utmost respect and and. Um, you know, and and you build trust slowly, not not just blindly. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. This is Lenona. Can I say something on the act, on the back end of that? Sure. I was going to say what you were saying about the woman of value thing, and coming from an emotionally abusive relationship, and being in a few more after that. If I'm being completely honest, but um, mm-hmm. it's the fact that you recognize the the problem, which actually happened in our book. Is what the book was about was that finding out that what you survive in life, what you go through in life, they are something, if you look at them in a positive light as badges of honor, then they can add value to you instead of looking at them in a negative light where you're like, oh, this is a scar. This is something that proves once again to myself that I'm less valuable. And that's how I was looking at things is, oh, this happened to me, so therefore I'm less valuable. No, I I overcame Mm -hmm. this, so therefore I'm more valuable. In fact, I'm coming up on priceless if I'm going to say so myself. I am a bit narcissistic about that. But anyway, <laughs> proving to yourself that you're worthwhile and, a, and truly a woman of ultimate value in your own eyes means that you're going to be out there. And when you decide, as Jade was saying about being inflexible, you have that list. And when you decide that you want that list or you toss a few things off that list, it's not because you're accepting a man. It's because you actually want to share your life with this person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and coming from abuse, Um, which many, many of our listeners have, it is very difficult to put the pieces back together because most of your life you've let other people control you um, in many ways. They've controlled your emotions. You know, you've let them because you didn't have the skills that you have now which help you to value who you are and to know this is is a line people don't cross anymore and I'm going to put up that velvet rope around me that says these are my boundaries you can't come here unless you are this person. And, you know, that changes everything. So, you know, it's great that, you, that you've that re- you recognized it because noticing what the issues are, knowing that you're the one common denominator, that's what helps you to solve the problems. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah, and Cindy, so I Dr. Just Argent. To add to that. 
Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Go, Go right ahead. Is this Renee? <laughs> well, no. Let's yeah, finish. Let's, let's hear from you, and then we'll hear from Dr. Oh. Argent. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, too, a part of that process of um, taking the time to, to love yourself, it is a process, and that's something that people um, don't realize is that going back into the dating scene after being in a, um, in a bad relationship, it doesn't have to be a, a, an immediate thing or a right away thing because friends sometimes they mean well and they'll tell you, um, you know, hey, go on out and let's hang out, let's go to the bar and let's go da da da. Sometimes that's not always the answer. And mm-hmm. I just wanted to, to just, you know, put it out there is that sometimes you need time so that you can find out what it is that you like, your dislikes and the things that you desire to have. And you need that. You need some space in between or some time so that you can be able to do some soul searching within yourself before you jump into another relationship and end up, you know, it being another failed relationship because you're going into, you could be going into the same thing or not worse. So it's good to just take a little bit of time and, you know, just a breather so that you can just find out who you are before you kind of, you know, put yourself back out there on the market, if you will, too, as well. I just want to say Yeah, that. and that's, that's a really good point. And I, I, I believe it's crucial. I don't think it's optional. Um, I think that we all need to take time and space to find out who we are again and to, to also recognize which parts we contributed to the relationship that didn't work because otherwise you end up in the same relationship over and over and over again. As, as um, well known as said, uh, you know, I had more than one abusive relationship. That's, that's what happens unless we take the time to say, okay, what happened and how can I avoid this? And so, yes, and also not to take forever to get back into the dating scene because right. you learn so much in the laboratory of dating. Um, from each date, and again, it's all how you see it. You know, to my my clients come away from each date with an assignment to find three good things that they liked about the man, and and two things that didn't, you know, suit them, and um, three things that they're proud of that they did on the date well, and two things that they'd like to do better next time. So it's it's all focused on learning and growing, so that you can get to that person who you want to meet and, you know, the right person. Awesome. Yeah. So, Dr. Argent, you want to answer this question about um, what's the most difficult part of a relationship that you've been through and how did you overcome it? Actually, the most difficult part of the relationship was I'm willing to accept other people, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true in the reverse. And a lot of things fall on women to be the ones who always do the compromising. And eventually, that comes with knowing self. Once you have learned who you are and what you're about, that's when you suddenly put your foot down and say, you know what, no. I'm tired of being the one who compromises. So that part I did learn very quickly, uh, what I will and will not accept. And in a lot of relationships, women have been environmentally conditioned from birth, straight out the womb, that that's your job mm-hmm. you, to be, yeah. you know, be somebody's, you know, something. But it doesn't help you be a, your own person. And you do have to go through a lot of, they expect you to do that when you're young, like, you know, when you're teens and whatever, and you go through the bad dating when you're teens, but not every teenager dates, not every teenager gets asked out. So a lot of women don't start that and don't go through that and don't know how to live through it until they've gotten older. And then by then you're, you know, you've got 20 million people pulling you in different directions, but it all falls back to, Oh, look, you're the female and it's your job to be less than, or always be the one who bows down and says, okay, what you want to do is right. And what I want to do doesn't matter. Uh And it causes a lot of problems when you get older especially if you're in abusive relationships and that's where a lot of abusive relationships start because you don't have any better grounding and there's no environmental conditioning out there that tells you um, this is not the way. So 
I, I hear what you're saying, and yes, it is a big problem with conditioning. Um, women are conditioned to be givers and compromisers. I used to feel like a pretzel in my marriage, like I'm willing to do all these things and he's not willing to compromise at all. Like what is up with that? And I remember sitting in therapy going, uh, don't you see this is not working? Like how can we make him do more? And um, it, it just wasn't going to happen. So obviously people don't change unless they want to. But part of the problem is that we continue to keep doing and doing and doing and we don't create the space for a man to show up number one because if you you know if you're in a relationship with somebody and that's true of friendship too you if you were friends with somebody and they just kept saying here let me make this meal for you oh don't worry i got this hey i'm gonna do everything for you You don't have to do anything it's fine (laughs) first of all you disrespect that person you would start relying on them to do everything for you you'd become really lazy you know so it doesn't really matter who it is it's we we are reacting to the people that we're in relationship with. So how can you create a different reality? How can you create a different type of relationship if you are a giver? Well, Jade, again, I guess I'm going to be on this all speak, but, you know, so don't do it and everything. <laughs> but <laughs> Winona will attest to, because Winona and I are great friends, and she was really funny. One day she came to my house and I had just gotten married. And she said, why haven't you, you vacuumed the floor? And I said, well, that's my husband's job. She said, what? And I said, that's what he does. And she's like, well, I mean, he worked all day. I, I worked all day too. But I dusted the house and cleaned the bathroom. He can vacuum the, the house. And it's not because I didn't care. It was because I needed to set the firm boundary that, yes, we both work all day. And yes, we are both tired. But we both want a clean house. So if you're not willing to show up, then your floors are just going to look horrible. And this is Winona, and I'm going to say she taught me a very vital lesson because I am not a giver. I am a super giver. I believe if you have not given until you your heart breaks, you have not started to give correctly. In fact, one of my boyfriends at that time was um, – I, he, I had to go to work. I had to be at work at 3 in the morning in a different state. So I woke up at 12.30 and made him an entire breakfast, came and served it to him in his car, rode down almost with him, and then drove myself back. And he was like, eh, whatever, <laughs> because I did it all the time. So, yeah, but he took it for I granted. I learned from Kate, hey, her marriage actually works. <laughs> My relationships have been dysfunctional, and so have my yep. dating life, my, and so that's why, why my marriage. So I learned that from her, and it was that's really good. funny because my husband did come home, and this is Jade. My husband did come home, and he vacuumed the floor because he knew well, I expected it. It was Wednesday, and um, we vacuumed floors on Wednesday. Mhm. So you set a boundary, and you stuck to it. And, well, Nona, you became a doormat and became unappreciated. So it's Very it's a really imp- – yes, and, and people don't appreciate doormats. It's just you have devalued yourself when you're giving without, without receiving anything in return. Um, so that boundary word, that's like, you know, secret weapon. Um, I'm actually working on a, a new workshop with another co-leader about boundaries because – I love teaching boundaries. I think we as women in particular are terrible at setting boundaries and keeping them. We can set them sometimes and then be like, oh, well, whatever. And then, you know, we don't enforce them. So it's knowing how to do it with grace as a woman, not as a demanding, you know, combat officer. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's that's really important. So, so well, Mona, I hope that you're setting boundaries these days. I definitely am. Between Jade and Dr. Argent teaching me, I'm doing a great job. And I wrote, and, you know, with my writing and writing a list, I'm doing a pretty decent job doing that. And now I have much better Good. boyfriends. <laughs> Good. Well, that's how it works. You respect yourself. You set boundaries. The, the men you attract into your life are going to respect yours, too, or they're going to be taking a hike. So who else wants to talk about um how to create a different relationship when you've been a giver. Um, this is Renee. I I was told um, when I first got married, my mom said to me, 
however you start out in a relationship, that's what they expect you to be all the time. And I found that to be very true. And I, too, was, had started out in my marriage of um, cooking, you know, um, all the time. I was cleaning because I enjoyed doing it. I thought it was the thing to do, the wifely duties. You know, I was playing the role of a wife. And then when it got to the point where I became tired and I was pregnant and I couldn't do as much as I wanted to and would have liked to because my body would not allow me, it was then everything was still fell on my shoulders. Everything still fell on my shoulders. And I could not understand But then I went back to that very thought of when my mom said to me, however you start out in a relationship, it is what the spouse will expect from you throughout. And when you can't produce that, it then causes problems. Because it wasn't dealt with at the beginning, those standards put in place or those those boundaries, if you will, that we've spoken on, it, it became such a big misunderstanding in the relationship because now what was expected of me, I became no longer happy to do it because, again, you started to feel like you were being taken uh, for granted and that there were no um, discussions that were ever brought up. And had we probably, had we just communicated at the very beginning of the relationship and said, you know what, let's sit down, let's come up with a plan Let's see how we can make this work and compromise. You know, this is what we could do together, and this is to share the responsibilities. And because that was never done, we became unhappy, and we grew apart, and it got to the point where we had, it, it got to the point where we had no communication because, because of something that could have been dealt with at the very beginning of our relationship got out of control, and we couldn't get back from it and didn't know how to Pulled, we didn't know how to recover from it, actually. So, mm. you know. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, a, this is one. Of, uh, this is one. Of, no, I, I just think wanted, it goes back to being a woman of value. Yep. Well, I want to. I want to say that um, you brought up the other piece that's crucial, which is communication. So it's it's knowing what you want and communicating it from the start. And what happens often is something what you describe, Renee, is very common, which is that women in particular, men do this too, but women will often morph into something that they think a man wants just to get into his good graces. And exactly. once they're in the relationship and they, they don't, it doesn't work anymore, then they're like, well, this doesn't work for me. But he's like, well, I married the woman who vacuums and cleans and cooks. I, that's what I wanted. I don't. I don't want this woman who speaks up and says she's not happy. So it's it's so important, and that's one of the advantages to dating when you're older and you've gone through these experiences is you can actually speak up and say what you want from the start because you know what it feels like to be on the other end. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds like you ladies are learning and growing, which is awesome. So let's finish with Dr. Arjun and have you weigh in on this topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, about which the recovery or what you learn afterwards. Yeah, reco- like how do you recover from being a giver? Like what what are your t- key tips in in um not overgiving in a relationship? Well, as we we've already touched upon, you, you have to actually well, first you have to know yourself, and that's the biggest problem. And once you know yourself, then you have the ability to communicate your wants and your needs and and your desires. But you have to make time to do that. And a lot of people, they just rush into everything. Rush, 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 rush. Every, you know, everything's instant. Well, relationships nowadays are so instant, it's kind of almost comical. But nobody takes the time to talk to one another. And then you actually have to listen, not just hear the other person speaking, but you need to listen. And listening isn't just using your ears. Listening is paying attention to the little things, the little details. They may say one thing, but their body language is saying something else. You need to pay attention to which one of those is probably true. And 
that will definitely get you out of a lot of situations and let you know, okay, this person's potentially abusive or this person's got something else going on over here on the side that we need to, you know, address before you allow yourself to even begin to get in a relationship. And that's one thing people don't use dating for. They're so busy using it to try to jump right back into a full-blown relationship that they don't use it as a tool to weed out undesirable situations. You go out, you have yep. fun, but you need to pay attention to the people you're going out and having fun with. You're going out and having fun with a serial killer. You might want to know that. I'm just saying. <laughs> you <laughs> have too much fun in the end. <laughs> right. That is well, true. I mean, they may not kill uh, you, but, you know, you never know. They may have a whole thing going on in the basement. You, you know. That's true. <laughs> you don't want to find that out to when you're too far in. Um, I actually have a working title for a book that I'm writing called Eyes Wide Open, Legs Firmly Shut. And it's it's about smarter dating. Um, we tend to go in with eyes shut and legs open, and it's it, it just comes back to bite us in the butt. So, um, yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, we are at the end of this show, and this has been really, really fun and informative. And um, so if you can tell people how to find your book and whatever else you want to let people know. Well, we're the end I thought ladies and you can find our books on Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, and AndWeThought.com. The titles of the books being And I Thought Divorce Was Bad, our relationship book, And I Thought Being Grown Up Was Easy, And I Thought I Did My Journey Alone, And I Thought I Had It All Figured Out, and our CD of poetry, And I Thought the Poetry CD. We also have shows on AndWeThought.com, and Jade, would you like to tell people about that? Oh, yes. So if you check out our shows on andrethought.com or YouTube, they're just very silly. We have a lot of fun, though. Our guests are very interesting experts, and they talk about everything from business to dating. to We talk about everything. <laughs> and also, I wanted to say that the And I Thought series is literally a series of us growing. Exactly. Of us being of finding out things in our lives that we didn't know actually existed or we took time to do introspect- introspection. Wow, I can't, can't talk today. <laughs> introspection. Mm-hmm. And we just wrote down our thoughts. That's also great. on our show, well, you'll it- have our video show. To grow to podcast and our conference is on March the 18th, Inspirational Women and Literature Conference. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for joining me here at Last First Date Radio and Keep on inspiring others to show and showing them that you can learn no matter where you start from. You can grow and become these amazing women of value who have gone on to attract better relationships into your life. Thank you for having having us. us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, And thank you all for listening today. And I hope you go on your last first date very soon. Have a great day. (laughs) 